Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. This is the post game podcast. The Timberwolves were defeated by the Atlanta Hawks on Wednesday night on the road by 12. There's a ton to talk about from this one, from a huge Timberwolves lead early to a, a nightmare third quarter and ultimately a, a double digit loss in a game that the Wolves certainly should not have lost by double digits. Anthony Edwards ejected Carl Anthony Towns, a super weird turn of events involving Carl Anthony Towns and a flagrant foul that you, you better believe we're going to talk about on the show today. Also other key takeaways, individual studs and duds. It's a packed show. We're going to talk all about it tonight. Welcome in. You are locked on wolves. <laughs> You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. I'm also the editor of Dunking with Wolves. The Timberwolves site on the Fan Side Network. Happy Thursday, everybody. This is the post game podcast. We're talking Timberwolves Hawks from Wednesday night. And there's a lot to talk about in this one. Uh, certainly, key takeaways, individual studs and duds, as we always do. I'm going to get on a bit of a soapbox about, uh, well, a couple of things, but we'll talk about Anthony Edwards' ejection. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about Carl Anthony Towns and the, the flagrant foul that, that shouldn't have been, but was. Um, it's all coming up. We got, we got a ton today. Uh, first of all, though, thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. The show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, the all-new Odyssey app. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T-Wolves and also at B Beacon. That's with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, um, let's let's do this. Let's talk about everything that went right early in the game. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a, just a a chunk of the show talking about the Towns thing in the third quarter, because I have a lot of thoughts on this. I don't talk about officiating very much, but if we're ever going to talk about it, uh, this this is the time. Um, so the game started out well for the Wolves. I, I mean, which is an understatement. Minnesota scored 42 in the first quarter, amazing offense early, running and gunning, running the floor, you know, extremely similar actually to the game just the night before in New York, where the Timberwolves controlled the pace early. Now the Hawks are totally fine with playing fast. They actually have one of the best offenses in the league, despite having a terrible season to this point, uh, relative to expectations, of course. Um, but the Hawks' defense is horrible. So the Wolves ran them out of the gym in the first quarter and actually played decent defense themselves. It made the Hawks really work. Easily could have been really, I mean, what? It was a 16-point deficit or 16-point lead, I should say, for the Wolves at the end of the first quarter. Easily could have been 20. The Hawks had a couple of late baskets that that uh, they were able to score. But Minnesota was actually making the Hawks work for their shots in the first quarter. Second quarter, the defense got a little bit lazy. Offense came a lot easier for Atlanta. The Timberwolves offense slowed down just a little bit. Uh, they still ended up with with 73 at halftime and a uh, and still a, a 12 point lead at halftime. Minnesota Minnesota had the 12 point lead at halftime. Uh, but for the most part, offensive execution very good. Anthony Edwards was fantastic. Uh, Trey Young, I mean, started the game. He scored zero points in the first quarter. And the Timberwolves did a pretty good job limiting him. Patrick Beverly only played the first six minutes of the game, then then twisted his ankle, rolled his ankle, didn't play the rest of the game, was on the bench with the team, was doubtful to return, ended up not playing, obviously, with the game getting out of hand late. And I don't think he was going to play anyway. Um, all that to say, it didn't look serious, but it obviously changed the Timberwolves' plans defensively. Josh Kogi got some earlier run than was likely planned. Jade McDaniels ended up on Trey Young a fair amount. And Trey had no points in the first quarter. He had seven in the second quarter, got... It made a couple of shots at the end, got fouled, got to the free throw line a couple of times. I think he had two trips to the line and a three pointer late in the second quarter. So he had seven at halftime. And then he went absolutely just went bonkers in the third quarter. The Hawks ran a set to get him a, a, a three pointer right out of the locker room or, or in their first possession out of the locker room in the third quarter. He made the three. And that's when I think we all knew the Timberwolves were in trouble. And sure enough, Trey goes off. The Timberwolves defense is, is essentially non existent before any of the, the craziness happened with Carl Anthony Towns. The Hawks had already scored 42 points in the quarter. They had matched the Timberwolves 42 from the first quarter in the third. Problem was the Wolves couldn't even do as much offensively as Atlanta did in the first. So the Atlanta had built a 10 point lead late in the third quarter because the Timberwolves defense was, was so shoddy. And we'll talk more about that in key takeaways. And then the play in question happened when Carl Anthony Towns gets the ball off after a sideline out of bounds, goes to shoot a fadeaway jumper from uh, essentially the right baseline. Um, 
And guarded by Nyeka Kongwu, the, he and Towns have been going at it a little bit to that point in the game. Towns hits the fadeaway, uh, clearly before the buzzer. And Kongwu falls to the floor, falls forward. Towns, uh, you've seen the play, likely, if you're listening to this, right? So Towns kicks his leg out. It was it was a Dirk-style, one-legged fallaway, really. More 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 of a fallaway jumper than a fadeaway. Um, and it's the Dirk thing. Towns does it every, like, three games. Makes it about half the time. Doesn't use it all that often. But it worked here. He made the shot. Timberwolves cut it to eight. He gets a tech, a technical foul for for kind of he didn't even walk over uh, a Kongwu. He just kind of looked down at him, looked at the bench, smirked, walked back. He gets called for a technical, of course, whatever. Fine. Come back from commercial break and everybody finds out that actually they're reviewing something. It comes becomes very clear that they're reviewing whether or not there's a flagrant foul on the kickout. And I have several issues with this. So, first of all, the taunting technical is weak, but I understand by the letter of the law. Sure, it's it's taunting fine uh whatever it's it's a free throw i don't like it because here's the thing like i think fans like to see that sort of thing more than they like to see a parade to the free throw line for technical fouls and guys because now towns even if nothing else happens he's got to be careful the rest of the game because if he looks at somebody wrong or says something on the bench too loud or whatever he's ejected from this game right and we saw that earlier the anthony edwards ejection I, i'm not going to spend much time on that he, he deserved to get ejected with the way he responded on that play Yes, he should be getting the free throw line more often, but the Edwards thing, I'm not even going to argue that that shouldn't have been an ejection. Everybody knows if you run at a ref and cuss at him the whole time and get a tech and keep running at him and keep swearing, you're going to get another tech. You're going to get ejected. But the Towns thing, like the taunting techs need to stop. I mean, that's ridiculous. But anyway, fine. Letter of the law, technical. Okay. Reviewing the shot is pretty weak as well, but okay. Um, and Bill Kennedy said to a pool reporter, I got the quote here uh, after the game. He said, the end of the period replay review is triggered with a made basket. So they were, the review was triggered because it was a made basket at the end of the period. This is absurd because Towns released the shot. Go back and watch it. 1.1 seconds on the clock. The buzzer goes off right before the ball goes through the rim. I mean, if, if we have to review that, then what are we doing in the first place? Like that, that to me is the first issue. Like why, why are they even bothering? I get it's the end of the period. They do it during the commercial break, but like stupid, like what? It just makes no sense. Then the fact that we're retroactively applying a flagrant foul is just insane to me. And here, here's here's the kicker for me is you always if you watch basketball, it's always explained. Intent doesn't matter in a flagrant foul, right? He was going for the ball, but you know, you're going to block a shot on a fast break, but you your elbow hits a guy in the forehead and he's bleeding everywhere. Still probably a flagrant too, whether or not you tried to hit his head and make him bleed everywhere. You weren't trying to do that, you were trying to block the shot. But it was still excessive and uh, unnecessary and excessive, I think, are the two qualifiers. So unnecessary is flagrant one. Excessive is is added to that for a flagrant penalty two foul. Um, but the intent doesn't matter there, right? Unless it, nobody's nobody's head hunting, right? And it's obvious if they are. But you're still called for flagrant one or flagrant two because you're still responsible for your actions, right? So why is the town's kick out a flagrant foul? when it's unclear if there was even real contact made, at least by any of the TV replays on either the Hawks broadcast or the Timberwolves broadcast. And if they're calling a flagrant for him, kicking him below the belt in the groin area, then are we now legislating intent that we're not supposed to apply when it comes to flagrant fouls? Like, how are we determining that Towns was looking at the rim, looking, watching, following his shot, trying to make a basket at the buzzer and also deciding to kick his foot towards the midsection of a defender who's falling forward, by the way, also move also a moving target if you will if you're trying to make a shot and kick somebody very squarely in a in a specific place on their body while you're shooting a shot it makes no sense at all so for legislating intent uh why don't we do that on other plays then uh, why why is that what we're doing here why is that not incidental contact and if it's incidental contact then it's not a foul much less a flagrant foul that's what happens when you shoot a fall away jumper or a fade away jumper there is contact so what happens when you rebound and a guy catch you know, uh, or or early in the game, Trey Young tripped uh, in a open floor situation, tripped on a Timberwolves player's foot. It wasn't a foul; it was incidental contact. Nobody stuck their leg out. It wasn't an intentional trip. Whatever, uh, it's not a foul. So why is this an offensive foul on Carl Anthony Towns for apparently? And, and they, you know, it wasn't said by Bill Kennedy during the game or after the game that it was intentional. But if it's not intentional, why is it a flagrant foul? I don't, and if it is intentional, why are we legislating intent? So what all, what does all this mean? 
it's a five point swing because the basket doesn't count the technical plus the two flagrant free throws. And it could have been as much as an eight point swing or even a nine point swing. If the Hawks then score off the inbounds play with 0.9 left after they put 0.9 back on the clock or 0.6, I guess to finish uh, the rest of the third quarter. So what you're saying is, or what Bill Kennedy and, and the officials are saying is that the Timberwolves would have been better off if Towns had missed the shot. If he misses the shot, there's no technical, there's no review. So that means there's no flagrant. So nothing would have happened. Instead, the Timberwolves are down to three additional points because of a review that took place for a shot that was attempted with more than a second left on the clock in the period. And then a retroactive decision that there was intent on a kickout to commit a flagrant foul. And then the taunting foul that wouldn't have happened had the shot not counted, which it didn't count, were all still applied. You got that? Because that's that's what we were, that's what happened at the end of the third quarter. Um I don't I don't know. I don't really know what else to say about it. I mean, that's that's everything, right? Um now back to back to if you're a regular listener to this podcast, I don't talk about officiating often. So back to your regularly scheduled Lockdown Wolves podcast. The rest of the show is breaking down the issues that Timberwolves had. The, Timber, the Timberwolves would have lost this game anyway. I'm fairly confident of that. Yes, it would have been eight points instead of 13, but the Wolves weren't going to come back and win this game. No Anthony Edwards, no Patrick Beverly. The the Trey, you know, the the top was already off, right? Trey Young was already going to win this thing. The Timberwolves weren't going to win. I'm not, I mean, yes, it's a five-point swing. That matters, the whole thing. I get that. Um, that's not why it bothered me. The Timberwolves did not deserve to win this game. It just bothers me because, I, I mean, well, for all the reasons I already listed, like what, what what are we doing? I mean, this is basketball, right? So why are we why are we doing why are we doing what happened at the end of the third quarter in this game? It's going to spend the rest of the show talking about key takeaways from this game, individual studs and duds, um, and and really drill down into the problems that the Timberwolves had in this game and a couple things that went right, especially early in the game. So that's all coming up. No more uh, no more officiating talk. I you have my word on that, but uh, I mean, if somebody can explain this to me. Please do. I don't get it. Uh, all right. Before we get into key takeaways, let's talk about our friends over at betonline.ag. BetOnline would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. BetOnline remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. New year and a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to get started. From football to basketball, hockey to boxing, plus UFC, Right on down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. All right, let's talk key takeaways from this one. So the first one is uh, D'Angelo Russell in this game, he was fantastic offensively. You could tell from the beginning of the game, this is one of those D'Lo games where he was going to shoot the ball really well. He was going to be aggressive. He also passed the ball fairly well in this game. Um, however, in his performance is the one that stuck out. Now, actually, really, Ant was playing really well before he was ejected. Towns almost had a triple-double in this game, 17-10-7, and 7, played pretty well too. Uh, but D'Lo was the one that stuck out. The problem was the Timberwolves' point of attack defense was miserable all night. He was part of that issue, actually one of the key culprits here. Uh, now, I say this as somebody who's talked a lot on this show about how much better D'Lo has been defensively this year, and that's 100% true. He's been a lot better this year defensively than really ever in his career. This was not one of those games. Now, no Patrick Beverly Hurts, uh, certainly, and uh, that was that was a major issue. Also, Jared Vanderbilt got into foul trouble early. Uh, he had three fouls pretty early in the second quarter and ended up only playing 21 minutes in this game and fouling out. He's started to have a few more foul issues. I think this. I think it was maybe... Uh, it was probably the Memphis game, I think, that he fouled out of or had five fouls for much of the game. I think he did foul out of the Memphis game. This was, Vanderbilt played well when, when he wasn't picking up personal fouls in this game. He stuffed the stat sheet more than he has in recent games. Um, but no Beverly, Vanderbilt foul trouble. Jade McDaniels uh, wasn't as effective on either end of the floor in this game as the Wolves needed him to be. But Russell Beasley... Uh, th those those are the two, and actually Jalen Noel, those three all struggled with point of attack defense, um, and the Timberwolves sorely missed Beverly's length and Vanderbilt's length when he wasn't on the floor. Uh, D'Lo just was not, he was, he was a half step slow defensively, the rotations weren't crisp, he was not fighting through screens, and the Timberwolves defensive unit as a whole was not moving on a string like we've seen them do a lot 
more of late. The first quarter wasn't bad. And I don't know if it's the legs, you know, the second night of a back to back on the road that caught up to them kind of like midway through the second quarter and really caught up to them in the third quarter. But the first quarter was actually not bad um, in terms of defense. And then the rest of the game was just absolutely miserable. And we're talking about a top three offense in the league, but they still gave up 134, including a 45 point quarter, which is just insane. Um, so not great. No Patrick Beverly mattered, uh, obviously. And, and again, Vanderbilt was active. I mean, he had what three steals in this game. Yeah. Three steals in this game. Um, and, and the Hawks who don't turn the ball over a lot only turned it over 11 times. Five of them were Trey young. I mean, the wolves made his life really difficult early in the game, uh, forcing him to pass the ball over pass sometimes. But as the game wore on, it just, the defense was not nearly as effective. My second key takeaway is that Carl Anthony towns, if you're not going to double team him, he's going to have a really good game. We saw this against the Knicks on Tuesday. Tibbs did not. Tom Thibodeau did not want to double team Carl Anthony Towns much. He did not double team him on what ended up being the game winning possession for Minnesota in the final 30 seconds on Tuesday. But some of these older school coaches don't like to double in the post for whatever reason. Pride. Mostly uh, the Hawks didn't double cat when they faced Minnesota back uh, beginning of December. Now that was a game. The Hawks won, I think by double digits, even it was the middle of that five game losing streak that Minnesota had in early December. D'Angelo Russell, I believe missed that game. Um, but towns had a monster game. He had like 35 and 16 or something crazy in that game. And once again, the Hawks did not double him as the game went on. It wasn't as big of a deal. The wolves got down by so much after this run in the third, that was fueled by Trey young. The wolves weren't going to towns in the post down the stretch. Anyway, he was firing away from three and they obviously weren't, you know, at that point, the game was basically over, you know, early in the fourth quarter. It, at least it felt that way. I understand the Wolves got back to within six in the final couple of minutes, but the foul trouble, et cetera, had caught up with Cat. Early in the game, especially though, Towns was, I, he made like his first four or five shots from the field, I believe. And and uh, it didn't look like the Hawks were going to be able to slow him down. I mean, nobody on that team, Kongwu included, was going to be able to stop Towns one on one. He beat John Collins in the post. He beat Anyeka Kongwu in the post. If teams aren't going to double him, he's going to eat. And the fact that he only, end up with 17 points in 34 minutes in this game is a minor miracle for the Hawks. But again, I think it was the pace of the game and it was the suddenness with which the Hawks went on their, their run in the third quarter that kind of shifted the strategy for Minnesota. Um, but I mean, if teams don't want to double cat and they're there because remember doubling cat, all it's doing is getting the ball out of his hands and you would a hundred percent, every team 10 times out of 10 should rather Jade McDaniels be shooting an, even an open corner three. You'd rather have, if you're the defense, You'd rather have Jaden McDaniels shoot an open corner three than Carl Anthony Towns going one on one in the post. I, I should look it up on B ball index. I could almost guarantee you that Towns, in almost any situation with the ball in his hands, points per possession is higher than a Jaden McDaniels three point attempt. Um, but for whatever reason, the Hawks did not want to do that. They were right in this game, I guess. It worked out for them. They've obviously beaten the Wolves twice. So what do I know? But I, I just. I just don't think that's a winning strategy if you're a defense facing the Timberwolves. And I hope more teams try that because. I mean, Towns is his, those numbers that have been very good, but not as eye popping as in past years, mostly because there's more ball to go around and the team's better. Uh, those numbers are going to keep rising. They're going to come back up those individual, uh, you know, the, the counting stats, the, the offensive rebounds, the, the overall points per game, all that stuff's going to keep growing. If, if teams try and guard him one-on-one, -on -one. Um, my last takeaway is more of a broad thing uh, because there isn't much else to say other than great offense early, great defense early for Minnesota. Those things started to kind of meet in the middle in the second quarter. And the third quarter was just Trey young and then officiating absurdity at the end, lackadaisical defense, some really bad uh, overall turnovers. Weren't a major issue for Minnesota, but there were some really sloppy ones. Exactly what happened in the next game that let New York get back into the game in the second half on Tuesday. And then fourth quarter didn't matter. Cause at that point the wolves had decided they'd lost. I mean, mentally they just, kind of crumbled and maybe I guess that that could be another takeaway. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of stuff out floating around out there on Twitter about, you know, is it the mental toughness thing? Does it come with youth? I think that was even posed to Chris Finch post game. Or maybe he said that, that it could come with youth. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know that the officiating thing, I think that could be a little overblown um, in terms of how the wolves react. Now for Carl Anthony towns, I've talked about this plenty on this podcast. It is an issue. He has been too overt in his complaining during games. It's cost his team possessions in games because he doesn't get back. Not as much this year. He's certainly improved. That has been an issue for him. Um, certainly. 
Now, that doesn't mean he should get jobbed the way he was at the end of the third quarter in this game because that wasn't right, regardless of what player it is. But clearly, there's some stuff between Cat and officials that has to get sorted out. Chris Finch has alluded to as much. But as a team, I mean, you can't tell me that there aren't good teams. I mean, what about the common denominator here, Patrick Beverly? What about the Clippers, the Doc Rivers Clippers? I mean, I have never in my life watched a team that whined more about virtually everything. I mean, the Warriors whine constantly. I mean, you can't tell me there aren't good teams that are obnoxiously, you know, complaining towards officials all the time. The Timberwolves actually, grand scheme of things, aren't that bad, whereas they have a right to be upset. Uh, they certainly do struggle to defend without fouling because, I mean, regardless, like, I mean, the Timberwolves, the Timberwolves struggle there, right? But the free throw differential thing, the lack of free throw attempts for the Wolves and the constant parade to the free throw line for opponents. I talked about this on, I, I think it was Monday's show or maybe it was Tuesday's show, Tuesday's show. Um, the greatest free throw disparity in the league in terms of differential between free throw attempts for the offense versus what they give up defensively per game is insane. I mean, it's over four per game. Um, and so Chris Finch has a right to be upset. The Timberwolves have a right to be upset. I don't think that we can say, oh, the team's young. And so they can't, they can't get past this. I don't think that really makes sense. Um, because again, Timberwolves aren't the only team that complains to officials. It's the combination. It's the snowball that gets in their heads quite clearly. It's man, you know, Trey Young got hot. We were playing so well and gets ejected. Now the refs are out to get us. Now we're down double digits on the road and cats on the bench with a technical and foul. You know, he's got five fouls, by the way, the flagrant foul is his fifth foul of the game and it's a snowball. And, and then, you know, and no Patrick Beverly and whatever, but that could happen to any team. I, I do think, I do think there's something there that, that the wolves let those things compound a little bit, but I, I would not isolate it to complaining about officials. I don't think that that would be a fair characterization for this, uh, of how this Wolves team handles that adver adversity necessarily. My last takeaway was going to be, and I'll hit this really quick. Um, this was a frustrating game and probably a game, certainly a game the Wolves should have won, right? Up 16 at the end of the first quarter, up 12 at halftime. I mean, you score 42 in any quarter, you should not lose that game um, or 41. But it's the NBA. It happens. Trey Young's really good. The Hawks have a great offense. The Timberwolves have had a good defense all year. You know, Patrick Beverly hurts. Towns foul trouble hurts. Vanderbilt foul trouble hurts. The injustices at the end of the third quarter, injustices at the end of the third quarter hurt. Uh, it, you know, this happens. They they won a game in against the Knicks that they probably should have kicked away at the end, even if they should have put the Knicks away earlier. And they lost a game to the Hawks that they probably should have won. Uh, now they get three days off. They get to go home um, and get, I guess, back to 500 again, hopefully on Sunday. So, uh, not a sky's falling situation. Obviously there were some issues, the closing games, or I guess in this case, just coming out of the locker room at halftime needs some work, but not all too alarming in the grand scheme of things. I think minus the ejection ant played well, cat played well for the most part. D'Lo played very well offensively. The defense has been good all year. I don't think unless we start to see this 115, 120, 125 points per game, a regular thing for opponents. I don't think we need to be too worried about the defense suddenly collapsing upon itself uh, moving forward. All right, uh, let's close today by looking at individual studs and duds. We'll do that here next. All right, individual studs and duds from this one. Uh, number one for me, I, I mean, I'm actually, well... I don't know. It's tough because of the defensive component. I'm still going to go with D'Angelo Russell. And I know that I, I ripped on his point of attack defense, but like who didn't play well or who did play well defensively for the Wolves? Nobody. So name of the game studs and duds. We have to decide who played the three best players of the game were for the Wolves and who the worst player that the game was for the Wolves. Even if he didn't play particularly well defensively, he was dynamite on offense. That's D'Angelo Russell. 31 points, five assists, two steals, two rebounds, 10 of 18 from the field, five of 13 from three, both good numbers, six of nine, at the free throw line, he did have a block as well. He also committed four turnovers, which wasn't great. He was overpassed a little bit at times. Um, it, you know, distributing D'Lo, the dis the distributing version of D'Lo, the 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 guy who's looking to pass first, he makes a couple of those bad passes a game. We saw it against the Knicks too on Tuesday, early in that game when he was passing the ball really well. He made some mistakes, but by and large, this was a really good D'Angelo Russell game, and uh, he he really helped propel the Wolves to that double-digit lead early. So he is a stud for this game. Um, I'm also going to give one to Anthony Edwards, and I know he got ejected, and I know that what he did was not 
I mean, he should have known better. He should have known that he was going to get ejected for doing what he did. And apparently he apologized to the team after the game in the locker room, but he was so good before he got ejected 20 points, seven of 16 shooting. He had a couple of those, you know, tried to lull him to sleep and then hit a step back three that, that he should have, should not have done. Um, but he made four of his 10 three-point attempts. I mean, Hey, you do that every night. I guess I don't really care if you shoot 40% from three on 10 attempts every night. Uh, you know, 20 points, five rebounds in just 24 minutes, no assists, steals, blocks, turnovers at all, but a good ant game. I mean, he scored, had a couple of tough buckets going to the basket, a couple of really nice step back threes. There was one like completely James Harden esque three from the left wing that I was actually beyond the Harden move was probably still a travel that wasn't called, but knocked it down. It was, it was majestic. Um, so really fun Anthony Edwards game before he was ejected midway through the third quarter. And remember, 20 points in 24 minutes, five rebounds in 24 minutes. I mean, those are sort of nice numbers. Um, it was it was a good game for him before the ejection. And then my last one is Carl Anthony Towns. We're just going to go with the big three today. He had 17 points on 13 shots, 10 rebounds, seven assists, two steals and a block. He did have four turnovers and he did foul out. The foul out, not all his fault. The four turnovers, not all his fault. Um and he played well. I thought he controlled things in the paint. I mean, it's not like the Hawks. Yeah, John Collins had 17 and 12 um, and did some other stuff too, but it wasn't an easy 17 and 12, and he did some of that damage with Towns off the floor. Um, and Okongwu was fine, but, I mean, Towns controlled the game for the first half especially. Um, and then as the second half went on, obviously the, the game shifted entirely. But this was a decent Carl Anthony Towns game overall. And remember, nobody else on the Wolves really played all that well. Um, Malik Beasley... Did score 16 points. He made four threes, but it took him 16 shots to get his 16 points in 31 minutes. And in typical Malik Beasley fashion, he only had one assist in 31 minutes, just three rebounds, didn't do anything else, no steals or anything. Uh, also want to point out Jared Vanderbilt, not a stutter a dud, but I mean, he fouled out in 21 minutes. He still had 10 points, eight rebounds, three assists, three steals in this game in just 21 minutes. If he doesn't foul out. He stays on the floor. I mean, what are we're looking at a near triple double almost certainly. Uh, you know, probably a 15, 10 game. Um, so a good Jared Vanderbilt game, his over aggressiveness did hurt him in this one. However, a dud for me is going to have to be Josh Akogi. Uh, he struggled. Uh, it was tough. You know, him returning to Atlanta probably wasn't going to be a regular rotation member, except for the pa Patrick Beverly injury in the first quarter. Um, Akogi in 14 minutes, Oh, four shooting. And uh, he did grab three rebounds. He, and he scored three points at the free throw line, but he missed an open corner three. He missed two very makeable shots at the rim. And uh, I think actually three makeable shots at the rim. He completely blew a reverse layup. He missed an open layup. Just not a good showing for Josh Akogi. And, and, and I mean, it can't be easy for him to be in and out of the rotation like he has been for a player that's already not a strong offensive player, at least in terms of scoring the ball or really in general. Um, this this had to have been tough for him to, to suddenly be back in the rotation and having to guard Trey Young. He actually was okay on Trey. Uh, second quarter, that stint was not bad when Akogi was guarding him, but then just in general, the Hawks kept switching, getting uh, getting the switch on the Timberwolves where Akogi would end up having to guard somebody else, you know, DeAndre Hunter or somebody, and um, and it would be, you know, Jalen Noel getting switched on to Trey Young. We saw a lot of that in the third quarter as he was going off. It was it was Jalen Noel getting switched on to Trey Young, and that was smart by the Hawks to do that. I don't know why the Wolves didn't adjust themselves, uh, but that's that that was part of the issue for for the wolves um in this one is is not adjusting to trey young dominating in the third quarter and, and not thinking of a better way to try and slow down slow him down um that's really it i mean there's not much else to say i, I said my piece about the officiating i said my piece about the sky's not falling this is this is what it is the wolves are now I, I, they were only a game out of they were in the seventh spot only a game out of the coveted sixth spot which of course would take them out of the play in uh and, and into the solid solidly into the playoffs before this loss. Um, and now that obviously isn't the case. They return back home to take on the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, it's another one of these really brief homestands, another one game homestand, one game on Sunday against Brooklyn. So they've at least got three days off, no games Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday at home versus Brooklyn. And then back out on the road to the West coast, Portland, Golden State and Phoenix all next week. Um, the uh, we'll of course have a show Friday. I want to talk some trade deadline stuff. There's some more rumors out there. If there's any fallout from the town stuff, you know, uh, there will obviously be a last two minutes report from the league because this was a blowout at the end, basically. Um, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk 
trade deadline, et cetera, on Friday show. And then, of course, following the show or following the game Sunday night against Brooklyn, we will have a post game pod that will post late on Sunday. Be sure you're following and subscribe to Locked on Wolves wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And thank you to those of you that do make Locked on Wolves your first listen every day. Locked on Wolves is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, the Odyssey app. You can also follow on Twitter at Locked on T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K. Ian. That's all we have for you today. Thanks again for listening to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Of course, the Locked On Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. While you make Locked On Wolves your first listen, go ahead and make your second listen. Our friends at Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.